Welcome back. So this is the final video for Chapter 2 for Industrial Organization. Um, and this is a lot less math, so congratulations. Uh, basically, we just want to talk about, you know, how realistic is our um, view of firms in terms of profit maximization? What does profit maximization even really mean? Um, and how do we think about a firm's uh, view of the future, right? And so... Uh, in Intermediate Micro, you probably spent a lot of time thinking about um, how consumers think about the future, um, thinking about sort of a two-period model maybe uh, of that. Um, and if you go to graduate school, you spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, for firms, we want to think about, okay, well, firms are potentially infinitely lived, but of course they're run by managers who might have shorter time frames. Um, they need to think about profits, right? But should they think about short-term profits, long-term profits? Um, how patient can they be? And it's going to matter because especially when we start talking about sort of strategic interactions between firms, um, how they think about the future and how much they value the future is going to be important in, you know, which sort of equilibria we end up in, right? So firms, two firms that are very patient uh, will be much more likely to collude, for example, and enjoy higher profits now than a firm that is, you know, worried about the future, worried they might go bankrupt. And so they might, you know, uh, be more likely to, um, you know, cheat on an agreement to collude, for example. So let's talk about that a little bit um, in this video. So we have lots and lots of firms in the United States. So, uh, and only 18% of those, at least in 2008, are corporations, um, but they account for 81% of US sales. So uh, while most businesses are small businesses, um, most business is done by big businesses. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to think about. Um, for the most part, when we think about uh, firms here, we're thinking about at least medium to large firms, right? We're not thinking about the family-owned restaurant, um, the two-person law firm, um, the you know neighborhood plumber or electrician. Um, those are all firms, right? Um, and they all will do some of what we talk about. Um, but for the most part, we're thinking about sort of medium and large size firms that think a little bit more strategically. Now, our, our main assumption in economics about firms is that they maximize profits. Now, do they always maximize profits? No, of course not. Um, they're going to do other things, right? They are going to, you know, make investments. Um, they might make, you know, donations to causes they think are important, although sometimes that's really just to maximize profits as well. Um, but when we even think about maximizing profits, we have to think about, okay, well, are they maximizing this year's profits? Are they maximizing profits over the next five years, 10 years, forever? Um, even, you know, even the largest firms that have been around for a long time can't see into forever. So we have to think about that and think about what's the best way to model it. Um, the other thing to think about is sort of shareholder value, right? So this is the um, way that a lot of uh, business and economics uh, thinkers have sort of progressed over the last 40 years is that firms should maximize shareholder value. So obviously shareholders are the people who are, who own the firms. And so if we're talking about a public, you know, large corporation, then that's the people who actually own the stock of the company. Um, but, you know, shareholders could be a private equity firm. It could be a family. It could be whoever actually owns the firm. And so how do we maximize shareholder value, right? Do we um, maximize short-term profits? Uh, do we maximize just the, the stock price? Um, how do we think about the difference between dividends versus stock buybacks? And so all of those things go into the decision about maximizing shareholder value. Now the most, I said there wasn't a lot of math. That was a little bit of a lot because we have a little bit of a math right here, uh, but not too much. Um, when we wanna think about sort of today versus the future, we want to think about the discount factor. And so we're going to call it D. Um, in consumer theory, we often call it beta. Um, a little bit different, right? Sort of time preference there. Discount factor is going to have a little bit more sort of thoughts around interest rates and things like that. Um, it's going to be less than or equal to one. I suppose it could be equal to one if you were if you had no difference between today and 50 years in the future. But for the most part, we don't think that's realistic. Um, 
And basically what it means is that if we think about sort of profits and the future stream of profits, then how much we value them has to do with the discount factor. So this example is just saying, all right, we earn some level of profits pi every year. It's the same. Um, we discount it by the discount factor every year. So d to the zero power is just one, so we value that at pi, but d to the one is something less than one, right? So maybe it's 0.9. And so we value that at 0.9 times pi. And then the next year, it's d squared. And so 0.9 times 0.9 would be like 0.81, right? And so it would be 80%-ish of uh, our annual profits, and so on and so forth. Now, as you'll notice, that number is getting smaller and smaller and smaller because uh, d, our discount factor, is less than 1. And of course, we can, you know, because it's a converging geometric series, we can solve that and get pi over 1 minus d. Um, and so you can see, you know, that's going to be higher when d is close to 1, and it's going to be lower uh, when d is closer to 0. And so that's going to be really important because, you know, a firm who's very confident about the future, who uh, feels like they're going to be around in 5, 10, 20 years, they're going to have a D that's much higher, whereas firms that are worried about going bankrupt are going to have a much lower D, and so they're going to value the future much less. And so when we think about the discount factor, uh, we want to think about, okay, well, what is going into the discount factor? One is interest rates, right? Because interest rates we can think of as sort of the cost of uh, borrowing and lending, right? The, the sort of financial cost. When interest rates are low, right, as they sort of had been in that sort of beginning part of the 21st century, um, that means that, you know, there's not a big benefit to like putting a lot of savings in you know, now and then getting them in the future. And so future sums are worth, you know, kind of close to what present sums are. Um, but then when interest rates go up, now all of a sudden our discount factor is going to be lower. Now we're going to value present profits a lot more than future profits because we can take those profits and put them into some sort of savings vehicle and get all of that interest. Uh, so interest rates are going to be important. And I think, you know, one of the things that we've seen um, with the higher interest rates in 2023 is that a lot of firms are like, oh, goodness gracious, I thought I was very patient, but I'm not. Um, the other thing is just patience, right? So if, if the firms themselves or their shareholders are patient, they'll have a higher discount factor. They'll value the future um, more. Um, whereas if they are impatient, so if your shareholders are saying, give me dividends, give me stock buybacks, etc., cetera, um, then they're going to value the future less and you'll have a lower discount factor. And then, as I said, confidence about the future, right? A firm that's worried that it's going to go bankrupt will have a low discount factor. And that's going to be... Uh, an important issue in terms when we when we talk about things like collusion, whereas a firm that is you know confident about the future, confident about demand, confident that they'll be there in 20 years, they're going to have a higher discount factor. One of the things that we will talk about some in this class, and you'll probably talk about in a lot of your economics classes, is the principal agent problem. So in terms of firms. Uh, the problem is, is that the, the agent, the one who is actually making the decision, which are usually the sort of executives and managers of the firms, are not the same as the principals or the owners of the firms. And so how do the owners get the agents to do what they want them to do? And if you, you know, if you major in business or you get an MBA, you'll spend a lot of time thinking about executive and manager compensation. Um, and, you know, so you'll have things like profit sharing and stock options. Uh, and that's a way to sort of align uh, the principal and agent's interests. Um, now, you can take that all the way down, right? You can have profit sharing and stock options for everybody in the firm. Uh, because everybody in the firm has some impact uh, on the bottom line. And, you know, at the extreme, you can do an employee-owned firm and have the employees actually own the firm, and then the principal-agent problem uh, basically goes away. Um, 
the other issue is that sometimes the managers, the the agents will be have different risk tolerances than the owners, right? And so if the managers are more risk averse, right, then they'll take make safer decisions than the owners would want. Uh, maybe they don't want to lose their job. They want to make sure they have their job in the future. On the other hand, it could be that the shareholders have a longer time horizon than the managers, right? Maybe the managers say, hey, I'll be here, you know, two, three, four years, and then I'm going to go find a different job. And so what I want to do is load up on risk, um, see if I can maximize my payout, especially if you've, you know, aligned my interest with profit sharing and stock options. And now your managers are more risk loving uh, than your shareholders. And that could be a problem as well. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the questions in the financial crisis was how much the change from partnerships to public uh, companies in investment banking impacted the sort of risk tolerance in those companies um, and whether they took on more risk than they otherwise would have. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about sort of the boundaries of the firm, right? How big should a firm be? I mean, one of the things we already talked about in this chapter is that sort of uh, minimum and maybe maximum efficient scale. Um, so we want firms to be at least big enough to be producing at their sort of minimum cost um, and not so big that they're producing above it. Um, and then the, one of the other questions is like both a sort of horizontally and vertically, how much should a firm do? Should a firm, you know, buy some of its suppliers um, and integrate vertically? Should it buy some of its competitors and uh, get bigger that way? Um, so transaction costs will play a role, you know, profit in terms of the, the different firms will play a role. Um, and then regulations are important too, right? So one of the regulations that we've seen uh, play a big role is on sort of full-time employees, right? Firms face additional costs if a, an employee is full-time, they have to pay payroll taxes, they have to pay on unemployment insurance, all of these various things. And if they can just you know, hire contractors who are not employees of the firm, then those costs go away. They're borne now by the contractor. And so depending on the bargaining power between those two groups, that might be cheaper, although it's not necessarily what the regulations had in mind. Um, and then eventually, you know, firms could get so big that managers simply can't sort of keep track of everything. Uh, and that can be a problem, right? And so we, you know, as I said, IT might have, you know, made... Um, the sort of ideal firm size bigger, um, but it's not infinitely big. Um, and of course, as we talked about in chapter one, there are rules against being too big and having too large of a market share. Uh, and so that will play a role uh, as well. All right, so we will stop there. That's the end of chapter two. Uh, and we'll pick it up in the next video with chapter three.